Um, so it's called the most wanted. Basically, it's the most wanted contemporary artist right now. I mean, if you have uh, like 10 of their paintings, you can stop working and retire right now. Uh, so, uh, so this one, his name is uh, uh, Mr. Louis Trimans, and uh, he has quite some eyes, but I love his works, great, great, great painter. So uh, let's go and uh, start the painting. So this one is pretty simple, I mean, no, it's not simple, but the background at least is simple. Hmm. So I'm going to mix some, uh, I feel like there's an undertone of blue. Jeez, I might have to refill my palette. I was working on, a, on a, the, another painting, so it's why my palette is kind of uh, uh, low on colors. But you know, it's okay. I, I'm also low on liquid and so on. So Okay, so something like this, it's simple. We just need to... Um, let me do that because otherwise it's gonna bug me. I know it's making some noise. Uh, all we need to do is to. I'm putting some whites to get some lack of transparency. Uh, all we need to do is basically to just uh, shape the head of the guy. I know it's gonna be a dramatic portrait. I'm pretty excited about it because you know when people sit on a dark background like this, mostly when they have his eyes. It's always kind of dramatic. So now you're used to it, you know, I'm putting some um, liquid on the on the painting, I mean, on the canvas, on the paper, so it's kind of blocked the paper. Um, okay, so let's do some, let's do some drawing right now. Okay, so where's the ear, top of the ear, this one, here. The top of the other one, it's a bit higher, so it should be here. Then we have that line here like this. Okay, where's the bottom of the ear, here, and the, the other one is much lower. And he has something like this. Um, and then we go from here to here like this. So you see some stuff falling from my brush. It's because um, the painting on the palette is start drying and it creates some skin. And um, the chin, where is the chin? The chin is roughly here. Uh, maybe it's a bit higher. Maybe it's here actually because we have the neck. Here, the neckline here. So if we look the size of the here, the side of the chin, so we have the chin is about here. We have the jawline here. We have here, it's just... Um, like this. Like this. A little bit around. I'm cutting for a minute because I need to get freaking Ami. Ami. to reload the palette. Okay, so what about the jacket? So we have about 
the top of the jacket is somewhere here and somewhere here and then it goes down straight and straight what's a bit tricky is that I think my image the image I'm working from might be a little bit longer than the real image so but it's okay you know it's uh it's just a painting Okay, so I put the big architecture of the, the head. Now, you know, I'm playing with the, the hair as well. I feel like the hair are more like blue. So now you're, you're a little bit used to the way I paint. So, you know, I like to start free. Actually, the difficult part is to keep the feeling of freedom as we paint and not getting engulfed into the feeling of realism or the feeling of performing. We want to have something free and still um, demanding. Because sometimes freedom is, you know, I see a lot of people trying to paint like Basquiat. Um, and um, quite often, it doesn't work. Because Basquiat was not faking it. Basquiat was really Basquiat. And uh, I see a lot of people trying to do those kind of uh, woody free painting where you do all that stuff and so on, blah, blah, blah. It's fun, it's, you know. But uh, that's the thing. For Basquiat, it was not fun. It was a matter of survival. And uh, if you get used to it a little bit, you can tell the difference. So, that's what it is. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> you know, when I was a younger painter, I was uh, influenced by a lot of artists. And, you know, sometimes I was um, not copying, but being influenced by other artists. And I realized after, you know, a long time that... Um, I cannot be anybody else but myself. Okay, let's try to do some mapping now because we have some um, nice uh, color here. So, okay, where are the eyebrows? The eyebrows are pretty much the same height than the, the ears. Um, they're about here, okay? And then we have this nose that is pretty central. His eyes, you know, where are the... the, the the pupil, the pupil is about, okay, so we need to figure out what's the mouse. Okay, that's something else now. Like here. And here. Here. Okay, maybe I should stop now. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, it looks like a basket. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But more seriously, um, you know, coming, coming 20, 30 years after someone, 
It's not the hardest thing in the world. So the first time I saw the work of Basquiat was 19... Um, I was already fond of his work when I was in art school, so... We're talking about... Uh, Nineteen ninety um, ninety two. Anyway, long story, short story, just try to paint like you don't endorse the costume of someone else. It's, it never works. I mean, it's going to work, you know, like uh, for local galleries and so on. Um, for people who don't really know, you know, I see a lot of uh, I see a lot of works that are mostly where we live. We live in Florida, and Florida is kind of the. I mean, I see a lot of bad stuff. I mean, it's not bad. People have fun doing it. Good for them. But I mean, um, it's not necessarily something uh, powerful. Anyway, so you see, I'm really trying to now um, put that face out of the blue. So obviously, I did something, which is my image I'm working on is way wilder than the image I have on the screen. Well, it's okay, it's fine. You know, it doesn't have to be um, perfect. Maybe I'm doing a, a Giacometti version of, uh, of Luke Tuman. So basically, no, it's the opposite. I'm doing a, I'm doing a, um, I'm doing a, what's the name? Oh, geez. The name will come back to me later. Uh, you, all know, you all know the name. We all know the name I'm thinking about. So I put the mouse here. The mouse is actually much higher. That means the shade of the nose is somewhere here. That means the eyes are higher. I already told you, you need to be able to move everything. Because unless you're a genius, there's a lot of chance that what you're going to put won't be at the right place right away. So by accepting the fact that we can move things, that means we agree that um, I can make a mistake. You know, sometimes it's a couple of, couple of millimeters, like just, just like this, and sometimes it's like this. Here, my eyes were here, and now they're here. So it's about that. The real problem is to recognize we're wrong. If you can do that, you can be a good painter. If you can't, you can be a good painter too. But it's going to be, um, I don't know, maybe it's going to be easier actually. But for sure, the, 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 you know, the great master, the, the, the people that have always influenced me, um, they're absolutely capable of saying, I'm nothing. And so I love them so much. Because they have that acceptance of being absolutely fabulous and still recognizing that they are nothing or they can be nothing. So I don't know if you know the work of that gentleman, Luke Trimans. If you don't, I recommend that you can take a look at it. This whole series of The Most Wanted, as I said, is um, it's kind of a joke. You know, it's kind of a... I mean, those guys, his paintings are worth um, two, three, four, five million dollars. I don't know. 
and he's still capable to go to the supermarket and nobody bothers him because nobody knows who is him, who is him, who, geez, who is he. And so that's what I think fascinating. It's why I call that theory the most wanted because most of those guys are more wealthy than a lot of famous actors or musicians and so on who cannot go even to go get a coffee without getting annoyed. And those guys can walk outside and nobody knows who they are. And if you get, uh, as I say, if you have like five or they have twerks, then you can get retired. <coughs> Sometimes I wish I could be their friend and just tell them, uh, do you mind giving, giving me a couple of paintings? <coughs> I will cook for you. <clears throat> you know, you can come to my house and I will make some dinner or whatever. Which I don't think is okay, to be honest with you. I think it's kind of disturbing to think that some of those guys sell works for more money than Rembrandt or all those guys. I mean, they didn't choose it. It's just the art market that is doing a favor to them and telling them, you know, you can be rich. So I'm still doing my mapping thing basically saying, where is that point? Where is that point? How do they connect and so on? And I'm not even thinking about the likeness. It took me a long time to understand that. It's like the sugar in the coffee. The more you look for it, the less you find it. So likeness is the same. Likeness is something uh, by the way, I, uh, that line is not from me. But it's a really good line. It really says it. So just... Uh, Just let go. So you see, I'm already, already organizing the, the passage. So that means the, the connection between the air or whatever it is and the background. So th that photo is really interesting for that reason, by the way, it's because they already did the job of making sure we understand that um, the blurriness is, uh, is something really interesting because it helps actually uh, getting the whole thing uh, Circulating. Circulation of light is absolutely the most important thing in a painting to me, uh, which means that uh, my eyes are dancing to the rhythm of the artist that wants to teach me a, a dance. You know, basically, what I'm trying to do is to bring your eyes where I want. Either it's in a conscious way or in a conscious way. Because most of the time it's unconscious. Most of the time it's just linked to my own struggle, my own understanding, my own, you know, whatever you call it. And, um, you know, I'm just looking at things and translating them. By the way, uh, um, 
you know, it's um, I want I I would really, I would really would like would like I don't know if I can, but I would like to share with you that painting doesn't have to be um, so difficult. Painting can be just enjoyable, and um, and actually, if you don't enjoy it, the viewer is going to feel it, and the viewer might not forgive you about it. Um, you know, we have enough things in our life every day that are not great to avoid to spend another 30 minutes to look at someone who is struggling. What we want to look at is someone who is having fun. I remember one of the first time, um, actually it was the first time. So I, I knew the work of Philip Guston for many years. And I was like, what the heck? I mean, this guy is drawing like a five years old kid. And, um, and I went to his show at Beaubourg in 19, I think it was Beaubourg or Grand Palais, whatever. It was 19, um, 1996 or something. And I had the biggest, one of the biggest shock in my life. Like uh, I realized that um, what I love the most is not the talent, is not the gift is not, uh, you know, a lot of things. What I love the most is sharing with someone the pleasure of painting. And I had that with Guston. I could tell he had so much fun. He was just going back to being a child, kind of. And not like Picasso. Picasso is more of a... Picasso is a gifted child, not Guston. Guston is not a gifted child. Guston is a is an honest child. And I remember crying um, because his work touched me so deeply. And I was not expecting that, believe me. I was just expecting to see a, a dumb show where, not a dumb show, but not something really like I would be so moved. And I was so moved and I was so, um, so in love with his work and with the guy, I mean. So you see, I'm telling you that because that's what I'm doing right now. Right now, I'm just having fun. I'm just looking at all those things and they're so beautiful, they're so connected, they're so, the light is so amazing, the, the whole thing is just so freaking beautiful, you know, it's beautiful, look at that, look at all those little things getting together, those colors, this, oh my gosh, it's just, I'm so blessed to have the luxury um, to spend time doing that. Well, you know, some of you work in factories and in, you know, some of you are accountant. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I love accountant. No, I'm, what I mean by that is, you know, if you want to make the people love what you do, show them that you love to do it. And showing them that you love to do it doesn't mean you have to tell them that you're good. You can tell them, I'm not good, but I love to do it. There's many, many chances that people will love you more for saying you're not good, but you love doing it, than if you tell them, you know, I'm good, I'm really good, I'm the best. If you say that, they will say, you're the best, good for you. Just keep on doing it and leave me alone. Recognizing your incapacity to produce masterpieces is important because because um, most of the time we don't. Most of the time we create small little rocks on a pass. Anyway, you see I'm talking and, and the painting 
is keeping on. And I love it because I have um, a lot of different colors. I'm still working with my pretty large brush, which is nice as well because you know I don't spend time doing little chili bitty here and there. Chili bitty, I need to remember this one. So anyway, when you paint, show your weakness as much as you show your strength. You might not be loved for your strengths, but for your weaknesses if you admit them. So you see, we talk about, um, I mean, uh, I love people like Lucien Freud and, and, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, if I live it this way, or if I keep working this way, I could be close to a Lucien Freud painting. All the paintings have something in common. I mean, all the figurative paintings have something in common. And you know, same thing, you know, I was joking about looking at people doing some Basquiat. I see so many paintings trying to paint like Lucien Freud. And I did at some point. But you know what? I'm not Lucien Freud. And I could say it's sad. Um, I'm not sure it's that sad, actually. It's just what it is. And so I'm keeping on doing my mapping. I'm keeping on traveling around this town that is called uh, Luc Tumans and trying to put some landmark that I think are important and uh, giving up orders that I think are not. Correcting myself, saying, oh my gosh, this thing, actually it's true, this thing is a bit higher here. Um, he has a pretty rough skin. I mean, everybody would have a rough skin with such a lighting. I know a lot of women would not accept to be taking in photo with such a harsh light, but it's okay. You know, on the other end, it really gives him this strong um, gaze. So the other thing I want to really um, point is that there's nothing you can do about talent is uh, Picasso used to say that uh, talent, I mean, genius is 95% of, I mean, 5% of talent, 95% 95% of work. Um, and, um, I agree with that. So you need to train. You need to train yourself. It's like going to the gym. You need to just work and work and work and work. And at some point, there's going to be something that's going to become you. And uh, you will paint like you are. But it has to go through all that hard work. And I'm sorry, there's no other way. I don't know any great painter who is not a great worker. I don't know any great painter who's not spending hours and hours working in the studio. 
And uh, quite honestly, the difference is often between people making it and people not making it is not the talent, it's the amount of work we're putting. So don't give up. Just keep on, keep on, you know, working and and mostly always remember, you have to have fun. If you stop having fun, stop painting. Okay, I need a bit more turpentine, so let me get it. So now I'm narrowing down the elements. Um, I'm still having fun. I'm still really enjoying what I'm doing. And uh, now the great thing is that I'm starting seeing the result of my work, but I, I'm, I'm not trying to make it. It's coming to me. It's what I'm trying to explain to you about the the concept of um, enjoying what you're doing. If, if you start um, overthinking, overdoing and so on, you're going to bore people. So I don't care if you paint like Basquiat, I don't care if you paint like uh, um, Le Douanier, you know, Henri Rousseau and whatsoever, it, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you share with people your passion, your love, your demand. And don't share with them your greatness. Share with them yourself. Nobody is great or whatever. You know, I mean, I don't think Da Vinci or Michelangelo were walking this world thinking. Um, I mean, I'm not that sure, actually. Maybe, maybe I'm more wrong about that. I don't know. But uh, more seriously, I think, I think they were, at the end of the day, they were pretty humble people. Were they aware of their genius? Maybe, but that's something different. Being aware that you're talented doesn't mean you're pretentious. So just... Um, Just keep on and uh, never, ever stop um, being humble. People will love you for that. Nothing is more beautiful than that kid that is just the best in sport in the school and that is not arrogant or pretentious and you know, there's so many kids who are pretentious and arrogant and they want to be the best in everything and sport and so on or whatever, you know, in football team. And it doesn't work. And people just look at them saying, you know, you're an arrogant person and I don't want to care for you. I want to care for that kid that is actually um, make me feel like I'm special. Okay, I'm still mapping, I'm still doing the same thing. I'm sorry, I'm not really... It's hard to explain, you know, it's hard to explain what, you know, what it means to just look at something and feel like uh, there's so many things to say about that face. I mean, it's just, it's just fascinating. It just... I'm so blessed to have the luxury, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in the world who have to do... Um, not really pleasant thing to go through their days and here am I in painting so I'm, I'm not going to tell you I'm not going to lie to you it's the best job in the world and you know I don't necessarily make a lot of money I'm struggling it's not always easy 
Hmm. Not even talking about my own struggle to um, to even know if my work is interesting. It's okay. I made the decision a long time ago that uh, I might not become rich. Uh, I might not become um, um, Not, not might not become anything, but you know, there's some people who have my work on their walls, and uh, it's flattering. It's nice. It's love, and I think at the end of the day, if you paint, it's because you want to be loved. Maybe not. Maybe you just want to. Stay in some canvases. Uh, okay, there's something really special about him, and I'm, I need to really pay attention to that. Look how his eyes are absolutely not symmetrical. Like, this size is at least half an inch lower than this one. That's pretty funny. So what we're going to do, we're going to do like everybody's doing on Instagram, Facebook, and all those social media. We're going to put it through a filter who's going to make everything symmetrical, perfect, skin, perfect, and so on. And it won't look like him at all. No, I'm kidding. Let's never do that. Let's stick with the beauty of reality. That's what I love. Oh, geez, my dog is getting excited. Um, that's what I love about painting those people, by the way. It's why the Most Wanted series is really interesting for me because most of them, or at least, you know, the one I'm picking up, um, they don't try to, you know, they don't, they don't have plastic surgery, maybe some, but I, I doubt it, honestly. I think they're okay with their image, they're okay with uh, everything they are. They, they're just real people. They just want to be who they are. So I like that. Um, So this one is much lower, it's here. And always remember you have time. You know, it's not like a, it's not like I have a clicking something telling me, oh, you have a, you know, it's like, not like Joe party game or something where, um, you know, if I don't finish on time, um, 
they're going to take away a million dollars from me or something. I have time. I have time to understand the beauty of that man's face, the complexity uh, of all those colors dancing together. And you see, at any time, I'm taking a tiny, tiny brush and starting doing the eye and the eyebrow and the eyelash and so on. Um, I know some people do portraits like this. Um, I see them a lot on the, the social media. And um, it's okay. It's what they like, it's fine. I need to put some white in the eyes so I can look at my eyes so I'm going to use a smaller brush because of course that large brush is kind of a, a mess now so I'm just going to mix some ah, okay fine so now where is it okay we have that thing here so my eye is completely off this one it needs to be more like this so you see how I move my this side like by whatever, quite a lot actually, and I'm fine with it. What about this one? So the distance between the center of the eye and, and the, the nose here. Um, as you can tell, my studio is in my house. Okay, so now here. And once again, I can change it. I have time, it's just not. I love that blue. Because it's in this air here. Do you see that here? And I have some things going on here where it's kind of blurry. Now, I'm gonna use some black and I'm gonna do the pupil, which is that little black spot in his eye. So, okay, so if I do that here, how far is it? Look. The pupil is between those two spots, so it might be here, actually. What about this one? This one is about the elevation of that, so it's more like here, yes. And it's more like center between that and that, so it's more like here. Of course, it's not right. But that's the thing. I have the eternity to fix that. I have all the time to fix that. Nobody is going to tell me you need to finish that painting in 30 minutes. It starts looking like him, I know it's freaking scary. And once again, I'm not doing anything to do it. It is coming to me. It's just coming to me because I'm not asking for it. I'm just working with... Um,
with passion, with um, uh, with uh, humidity. My eyes need might have to change. I don't know. Okay, I think I think I'm going to be done for tonight. I'm going to let it dry. And tomorrow I will come back on that painting and do another whatever. Maybe maybe it's going to take me another 70 years to paint that. I don't know. It's okay. It's okay. What's important is the passion, the love I'm putting into it. I can share with the viewer. Okay. <laughs> Starts looking like him. It's crazy. You just you put things together and just like you know, it's like when you play the Lego. It's exactly the same thing. You know, you play the Lego. You remember with the kids, um, you have that box full with little pieces, and you look at it and you say, "Oh my gosh, that's not the Star Wars uh, spaceship that is that big because there are six thousand pieces and each of them looks like a little freaking rectangle." And when you start putting them together, that's where you realize that. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of bricks by bricks by bricks. You get to the point where you want. It's exactly the same thing. So, you know. Anyway, let's work on uh, Luke tomorrow. Okay, bye-bye. Have a good evening. Hi, guys. Um, welcome back. Um, that's uh, the portrait of Luke I studied yesterday. So I'm back to the studio and I'm going to work a little bit on it. Um, you know, at that point, I think, you know, most of my uh, big architect architecture is pretty okay. Now it's a lot about the passage, a lot about the making sure that um, it looks more defined and refined. So, um, you know, I need to restart my palette, of course, because it's um, pretty empty. I'm making some pink and I think I need to go more into the yellow side for now. It's always difficult to restart um, the next day when the palette is clean, but on the other hand, it's great because it's also helped to um, figure out exactly the, the, the colors. And so I'm, you know, I'm doing exactly the same thing than yesterday just a bit further just a bit more um, more distance from yesterday so you know I might see better today there's another artist from Belgium I really love um, his name is Michael Borman. And uh, he's an uh, amazing painter as well. I might do one of his portraits too. There's another one actually as well, but it's an older, older generation. His name is uh, Pierre Leszczynski. Uh, he's part of the Cobra movement. So Cobra was a big deal for me. Um, it was a time where I was um, just finishing art school and trying to transition from um, where I was at the time um, in my work, in my practice, to something maybe more more free and so on. And the Cobra was uh, was a movement. It's called Copenhagen, Bruxelles, Amsterdam. So it's people from the Netherlands and. Uh, 
um, people from Belgium. And so that's what I'm talking about. Uh, Pierre Wyszynski, and um, if you struggle with, um, you know, making the transition to contemporary art, you know, I know for some people it's it's difficult because, you know, we see art sometimes as something more, um, you know, for a lot of people, art has stopped a little bit in uh, after the Impressionist, or pretty much at the same time, you know. Um, Cobra is a good way to um, track the missing piece between contemporary and more traditional. So for me, it was uh, a great discovery to see the, the works of Asger Yorn, Karel Appel, Alishinsky. So when I start like this, you know, the day after, um, it's great because it's really, it's almost like looking through to the, to the painting with a fresh eye. So imagine if I was doing that for um, 20 or 30 times, which is pretty much what I do when I do commission portraits. I just uh, put the painting on the easel, sometimes for Sometimes for a really short period of time, sometimes it's five minutes. Put the painting up on the easel, look at it, see what I think is not okay, and just fixing it and putting back the painting um, in the studio, in the corner of the studio, and just forgetting about it for another, um, you know, a couple of days and going back on the painting and so on. It's really the best way to see more clearly what we do. If you work on your painting nonstop for days, you might at some point um, get stuck into your own, I won't say mistake, but your own vision of something. And sometimes it's not the right proportion or the right something. So don't hesitate to take some time off the painting. It really helps when you come back to have a more objective view on your piece. So you see I'm making some transition so basically, um, I started with pretty heavy brushwork and now I'm kind of making the brushwork more subtle. Some people will say that when the brushwork is thicker, it's more um, uh, expressionistic. Um, they like it more. It's really a matter of taste. What I learned through all those years of practice is that there will always be someone who likes what you're doing and there will always be someone who does not. And finding the, your audience, basically, meeting the people who support what you do is really important. You know, of course, if you show your work in, in New York or in a small town in France, you're not going to address the same public. Uh, the question is, is there a better public? Is there a public that is initiated and the public that is kind of dumb and doesn't know? Um, I think there's of course something about, um, you know, there's something can be considered as pretentious in, in some of those big towns, Paris, London, New York, you know, people think they People think they know more. Um, for sure, the big museums are in the big cities. Um, so logically, we could say, you know, people in big cities are more educated, so they know more and so on. Um, you know, it's all about what definition we give to art.
if art is about what I love is art and what I don't love is not art, then there's no question, there's no discussion, you know. Um, it's pretty obvious that, um, you know, people are going to look at something and the only thought they're going to have is, you know, if I like it, it's, it's art. If I don't, you know, it's not art. And um, of course, it's a bit more complex than that. On the other hand, what is pretty obvious is that our taste evolves. So what I lacked when I was 20, um, you know, either, if, either it's for music or, you know, there's things I still like, but there's things I'm not into anymore. So if our taste evolves, that means that we cannot really rely on saying that art is what we love, because art is something more intemporal. So finding your audience is, is really important. And, you know, if you, if you surround yourself, if you're surrounded with people who like what you do and collect your art, um, you don't have to justify anything else but that. And once again, you might meet some people who are going to tell you what you're doing is not art. Mostly, you know, when, when you do, um, when you do something that is more uh, popular, um, I think, you know, there's a lot of pretension also in the art world about, um, you know, pretending that we, we are part of that elite group that know what is good. So just... Uh, just do what you love and try to find the people who are going to support you. So, once again, I'm still, as you can tell, I'm brushing the, the work hoodie. Um, let me get closer so you have a better look at what I'm doing. So now I'm changing scale of my work. So now, of course, as you can tell, you know, my brush is, is barely dancing on the paper. Of course, because now I'm at the point where things are getting really subtle. So I'm working almost like I would work with um, with color pencils. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with color pencil. If you're not, you know, you, you, you maybe look into that because it's a great way of learning how to work with layers. And uh, so pretty much that's what I'm doing right now. You know, I'm just adding layers and layers and layers of, of colors really gently, not, I'm not going too strong, you know, just because as I said, you know, there's, it would be really easy to ruined everything by just becoming, um, by just doing something, you know, really like, you know, big brush and boom. So, because now it's really tiny details. So yeah, the, the, I, I did a lot of color pencil. I mean, not a lot, but when I was in art school, we studied colors with an amazing teacher and uh, most of what we're doing were color pencil. Uh, at the beginning, a lot of us were just like, we're not, we're not kindergarten, we're not going to use, kin, you know, color pencil because it's kind of a, you know, it sounds like for kids. Um, no, it's not. Color pencil are just amazing because, because you have to work with layers of colors. You don't mix the colors on your palette. You mix the colors directly on the paper by adding layers and layers of colors. And so it's a really good way to learn colors.
Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing exactly what I've done yesterday. Once again, as I say, you just a change of scale. Now I'm working in a more, um, with a smaller brush, but it's pretty still the same, you know, where I'm just judging colors and trying to find the right, um, cont I mean, clarity, um, and trying to balance the colors. Like for example, here it's a little bit more violet, I think. So I'm just gonna mix a little bit of blue and The hair, his hair looks really green and blue now that I'm working on the skin tone. Some color is going to appear to you as you work. So there's colors that are going to be, at the beginning you don't see them. And then as you work, you just, uh, you just see them more and more for what they are. And particularly on his face, I mean, you know, the, the, the logic thing would be to say, oh, his hair, he has gray hair. Uh, no, on that photo, he has blue hair, blue and violet. So you see, just by being patient, I'm building I'm building that thing. There's no magic. I mean, the, if there's some magic, it's more about, um, you know, my my skill to figure out the, the right color. Um, And at that point, I even don't have to really put any more um, liquid because now I'm really working so thin. So, for example, if you look at the, the, the reflection on his forehead, um, to me it's blue. And by putting blue, I'm going to create, uh, because the blue is going to be on top of uh, this orange and so if you think about it orange and blue are complementary colors so by doing that I don't even have necessarily to go really clear just the contrast between the blue and the, the orange is going to be enough to create that feeling of uh, something reflective so always try to see the colors beyond the color and beyond your knowledge, you know, like, uh, okay, it's a reflection, it's lighter, so I'm gonna do white. Um, no, always try to find an answer that is about colors. You know, when we see the work of the great master, you know, either it's Titian, uh, Van Dyck, Rembrandt. Um, of course, their draft mind skill is insane. It's just beautiful, you know. I mean, the way Van Dyck draw and Velasquez as well, it's fascinating. But what's fascinating as well is the colors. And if you look at Caravaggio, for example, Caravaggio is all dark, you know, there's no, there's not a lot of really light color, like white. So we can definitely do light without, you know, using too much white. And actually quite often the white creates some sort of a, of a, of a light, but it's not, it's not really a pleasant, um, 
light it's more um i mean you can see really when you go to museum you can see there's some there's some paintings that the colors are just making the painting and and some painters are really talented like uh, you know the the painter from the the 19th century um you know the what we call the um the academist but the colors are not that great and i think that's one of the reason why those painters have kind of uh, i won't say disappear but uh, they're not as important as uh, you know people like uh, money and so on and it's because of the colors so never think that um, I mean, to me, colors are definitely one on one of the most important factors in a painting. So you see, I was painting some some blue, and I had some teeny bit of orange just to make it a bit desaturated. I feel it was here; it's too saturated. So. On this one, I'm just going to add some black because I think I went a bit too light and I'm just going to paint really gently on top of it. I tried a little thing and it's, you know, that's where I'm, I was saying that you, I have to be careful of my knowledge because you see, I put some blue on top of the here to make the transition, but it's not on the image, it's red and I made it blue because I thought, you know, so that's where my brain can be overriding my sight. And on this thing, I paint not what I saw, but what I know. And it's why it doesn't work. Because I will always know less than the complexity of a face or the complexity of a portrait. You know, some people have asked me recently, um, you know, do you always need a model to paint? The answer is, um, the answer is yes, yes. I like to have a model because, um, because I'm not sure my work is about me. I think my work is more about my relationship to the world. And you know, everybody's different. I completely understand that for some of the painters, it's a different approach. And the other thing as well that is important is that um, we, as artists, we are part of a time. You know, we cannot just say um, that the time does not affect what we do, but also our viewers. So the way I'm painting today is uh, also a result of the time I'm living in. Okay, the painting start being built up. And that's what I explained as well in uh, some previous videos. That series is not about necessarily, you know, making a, an amazing photorealistic painting and so on. Um, I also uh, want the, the process to be, um, I mean, it's about the process. It's not really about the, the painting necessarily. Even if I'm going to use those painting for my personal work as a, as a project, I have an idea about what I want to do with them. But the goal was to do those painting in a not a limited time because I'm spending the time I want, but you know, I don't want you to spend uh, too much time on those paintings. Also, because I work a lot as a series. So you have to find the balance, you know, like, for example, I feel like this little 
touch here is too red so I'm just going to turn it down And you see, I'm moving things. I mean, I'm moving around a lot. I'm not saying, I mean, I'm not staying on the same spot. Um, you know, I work from a place to another. It's the reason why I'm working like this. It's because, you know, as I'm watching, um, as I'm looking at what I'm doing, I realize that, you know, for example, this area here is too dark or whatever. Then as soon as I see something, I'm fixing it. I'm trying to fix it. I'm trying to get more accurate and to get more of the, the right feeling. The reason why is because otherwise um, I might forget. So, you know, by working this way, I'm kind of embrace, embracing the, the entire image and that helps me to refresh my, my vision, my brain and uh, So, you know, might make me a little bit ADD. Yes, absolutely. By necessity, because, because something like this is so complex. There's so many information I need to integrate. There's no way I can paint something so complex. Um, without um, moving, you know, all the time. Because there's so many information to, to, to answer. You know, I feel a little bit like I'm in a, I'm a child at a, an amusement park and I'm seeing all those beautiful attractions and I just want to do everything at the same time, <laughs> which is not possible. And so I see something and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I need to do that. I'm so excited and so on. And so that's pretty much the way I'm, I'm feeling when I paint. You know, I'm, I'm, having, I'm almost ecstatic, I'm almost like... A, there's so much richness, there's so much beauty, there's so much colors, there's so, so much, so much that, uh, you know, I really need to um, you know, work everywhere, you know, and getting excited and seeing something and I really hope you can feel the same when you paint it's it's such a beautiful feeling you know to be absolutely mesmerized that what what we're seeing you know it's like when you look at your child playing or you know someone you love your you know f someone you love you know for will and you look and you just feel overwhelmed by the beauty so i feel like this when i paint and it's a it's a beautiful beautiful feeling And of course, sometimes it's frustrating because, you know, it's like trying to catch um, um, it's like trying to catch a, a, a rainbow. It's not going to happen. But you know, you're a child and you run or you ride your bike to the foot of the rainbow. It's never going to happen, but... Uh, you know, when you're that adult, you stop doing it. And uh, when I paint, I'm trying to catch the foot of the rainbow. And sometimes I'm 
you know. The, the, the strange thing is that quite often it took me years to appreciate my work. Um, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, when I look at my paintings, I'm not feeling so overwhelmed by it. You know, I don't enjoy it because I know it so much that I see all the things I haven't done properly and not the, seeing, the thing I've done the right way. So it can be a bit frustrating, of course. And I realize, you know, through all my years of experience now is, um, you know, sometimes I go in places and I see some of my woody, some of my woody old works, you know. And the great thing is when I forgot about them, when I'm just like, you know, um, I don't remember them. You know, if I had to make the list of all the painting I've done, they would not even be part of it because, you know, first of all, I've done so many paintings. But then when I see them, I remember them. And um, that's pretty much the only moment where I can really enjoy my work. And it's, uh, it's, it's really beautiful. It's something really beautiful when you can discover your work as, as, um, as you know, the first time you see it. You know, I have, I have a collection of paintings at a friend's house and um, it's a crazy story, but I've done so many portraits of that person, so many paintings, maybe a hundred, something like this. And he has them in his house, you know, it was when I was a younger painter and, um, you know, I was, didn't have a lot of money. And uh, this guy was an an amazing, unbelievable model. I mean, you know, some models, um, some models don't give you much. And it doesn't necessarily are the models that are the most uh, pretty um, that gives you the most. Sometimes it's actually the way around anyway. So I've done a lot of painting of that person and uh, when I go to his house sometimes it's just uh, fascinating because I see painting I haven't seen in I mean last time I went to his house was really strange because there's some painting I hadn't seen in 20 years and uh, so I was looking at the work like I was not the painter and that's actually a great experience for me So you see, I'm playing a lot with colors. Um, one of my favorite painters, uh, Lucian Freud, I use a lot of those things, you know, like colors like this and so on. And not as much, but still, you know, he's, he has a really colorful skin tone palette. And you see, I'm still painting with uh, my pretty large brush. I haven't went down to a smaller size brush yet. I will, but um, I'm really trying to... I mean, his skin is, is fascinating because, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of story on his face. So yeah, I was talking about, you know, the, the models and um, I was saying that, you know, some of the models don't give you uh, as much as others. Um, there's definitely models that sit in a room and the light comes and embrace them. And, uh, you know, it's not necessarily the most pretty models. It's not necessarily the beautiful girls. It's not necessarily um, all men. 
Um, it just, um, I don't know, the light has gifted them with skin tone or whatever that just uh, make everything about them beautiful. And on the other hand, you had, you know, you had really beautiful people, men, women, once again, it doesn't matter. I, I, I've done both many, many times. And, um, and so there's some models that just are not interesting to paint. I mean, not as much as other people. And, uh, you have to find your your place among that, you know. It's um, it's one of the reasons why I like to work also from from um, you know. I won't say from photos because I don't really work from, I don't consider I'm working from photos that much actually. I'm working from a TV screen and it's a, the di it's a different feeling. You know, I like the TV screen better because, um, and actually it's not even a TV screen I'm working on, it's a monitor uh, because the, the colors are better on a monitor than a TV screen. It's a matter of technology. You know, it's a little bit like, uh, to give you a, an idea, it's just like um, working from, from photos it can, be, can be a bit tricky for the reason that, you know, when you, when you come back from holidays or whatever, and you're looking at the photos you've taken, and uh, you look at them on the screen of your 2000 or, you know, whatever price, but pretty pricey computer with a great monitor, 4K, it's not even 4K, but you know, like a LED, blah, blah, blah. Then the photos looks fantastic. Um, the colors are vivid and so on. It's just perfect. And then you get those photos printed and they came out dead. Um, there's a reason for that. There's a, 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 a physical reason for that, which is uh, the difference between additive system and subtractive system. And if you have some time, you know, you can go and look at my, uh, my tutorial about the color theory where I explain that. I explain the reason why. Um, some of the... I mean, why we need to have um, more than three colors to print if you want good printing quality and sadly most of the printers use four colors black yellow red and blue so for me working with the from the the tv monitor it makes things so much better so you see, I'm getting to a point now where I'm starting really being happy about what I'm doing. First, he start looking like him. And then I really like the, the palette I'm creating, the colors. I might switch pretty soon to a smaller brush. His face is, is great because it allows me to, not to go in the caricature, but a tiny bit. I hope, Mr. Tremans, you don't, you're not mad at me for that. <laughs> um, but he's just have that amazing face 
that um, is so expressive. And so you see the, the, the photographic, um, let me see, yeah, it's okay. The photographic um, rendering, it's all a matter of time, how much time you spend, uh, how much uh, detail you get into it. Um, definitely my work is, is more about um, um, I mean, strangely, I sat around the brushwork and, and, and still there's, you know, if you look from close, there's a lot of brushwork, but the brushwork is not the subject. And it's by the multiplication, actually, of tiny information that I, at some point, make it look like it's really detailed or really well done. Um, but actually, if you look closely, then you see all those little brushwork and uh, it's why I'm changing of brush at some point to get to another scale of, of detail but it's still um, it's still the same it's just a matter of change of scale not change of, of technique or not you know it's not like at some point I decide to you know I decide to finish the painting um, I don't decide to finish the painting, it just because of the change of scale, at some point, the, the painting becomes more and more detailed to a point where I'm just, you know, I could move to even smaller brush and smaller brush and so on. But then if I do that, I would need um, glasses to see what I'm doing. Because that's part of the problem is that my own vision is limited by my capacity to see. Um, just to give you an, an example, you know, the, the human eye, we say it's, uh, we're 10 on 10. Uh, it's just a number. It's just a number that's been decided by scientists to say that uh, if you have 10 on 10, you have good eyes. You can, you don't need glasses, you can drive and so on. But that doesn't mean you can not get a better vision than 10 on 10, like a, an eagle or a an oak or you know those birds their vision is more like a if we are to measure their vision they are more like a 20 on or 50 on 10 so that means that they can see five more details than than the averages now that said um, some people uh, you know like some people are stronger than others some people are taller some people some people have a vision that is much more than 10 on 10 what I'm doing right now is I'm blending a little bit, so I'm smoothening because I don't necessarily want those big brushworks. So anyway, so yeah, so it, as I say, it's a matter of of of, uh, of scale, you know, of decided deciding what is my level of definition on the image, you know. If I um, if I wanted to, I could move to a really really tiny brush and work on that area for like three hours, and then I will get to a point where my work will really look like the photography. In some, you know, maybe even more because the photography has its own definition, so we can beat up the photography if we want to. Now, is it what I want? No, I have no interest into the... I mean, don't make me wrong, I'm, I'm impressed by hyper-realism. Hyper I think some of them are really, really interesting painting. Um, it's not something I want to do. But it's something I highly respect.
You know, the other thing is, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to learn how to do paintings, to draw and so on. I was so, and of course, you know, most, as most of the kids, we were impressed by the technique. The technique is what really, because there's a reassurance about the technique, you know, there's, there's something about the knowledge about the, about that, that makes us feel secure. And I think that's why most of the kids um, are more into the technique. And then, you know, as they, as they grow up, they can walk away from the technique and just uh, understand that the technique is just, is just a tool. But uh, the truth is that um, when I was 10 years old, if you dad showed me a painting like this and telling me that's what you're going to do one day, I would have been pretty, I guess, pretty, uh, pretty happy about it. I would have said, yeah, I would love to do something like this. Okay, I'm going to switch to a smaller brush now because I think um, I think I want to work mostly on the eyes now. So if you have to choose bef between, um, you know, um, going um, between two colors, always, I mean, not two colors, how would I say that? I would say, always try to remember that um, the darker you get, the more possibility with colors you have, you know, because of course the colors are going to be... Um, You're gonna have more leap freedom, you know, more possibilities. Let me check something. Yeah, that's great. You're gonna have more, more. Um, you're gonna have more possibilities into darker colors because, of course, you know, mostly when you go on clear uh, tones like this, if you start with something really light, you know, you're gonna end up with. Not a lot of possibilities of going into real colors. Um, so always try to make things not too light. Once again, we don't do light with white. We do the light with colors. At least that's the best way to make them. Colors are always more um, rich then uh, then black and white for me that that painting is more about the colors than anything else but to be honest with you the likeness is I mean, it's not anecdotic but definitely to me the colors are really where where i want to go And it's why working from a TV screen is so 
important because, I mean, not a TV screen, but a monitor. Um, because actually, um, the monitor is going to give me much more colors than uh, printed photos. So try to avoid to work from printed photos. Once again, um, if you want to look at my video about color theory, I explain why the colors photos have about 50% less color information than something like this. Okay, now let's play with his eyes with that uh, beautiful uh, light blue. I'm going to try with the blue, but that might be green actually. I'm not sure, it might be blue. And you know, always remember that uh, the, the colors are tricky because, you know, for example, on this one, because the white of the eyes, it's not white actually, it's a, it's a light blue, but it gives the, the illusion that the, the, round, the, the blue around the, the, the um, like that here, is, looks darker than what it is in real. Uh, it's like the black of the eye, you know, because it's just a little thing in the center. It feels really like it's black, but it's not really black. It's a, it's a bit lighter than black. So you see what I'm doing is instead of, I'm just, you know, making some little dots instead of trying to just draw a line or something, I'm just, you know, just working really gently because, because of course, you know, the, the, any kind of mistake here would make the, the eyes completely off. Okay, I have a little problem because um, he's not looking straight at us. So obviously I have a little problem with uh, alignment, you know, like, a, like a car alignment. So what I need to do is to go back, double check everything exactly like I've done for the rest. I think this size is actually, should move a little bit on the left. So I might have to repaint it. So you see, that's exactly the problem. I, I painted the eyes, so now I have two solutions. Either I'm thinking, oh, I'm not gonna repaint that eye because I've done such a great job on this one. I don't want to lose it. And then I've done the portrait of someone, but it's not the person I was trying to do a portrait of. Or I'm just thinking, you know what? It doesn't work, I have to redo it. Then I redo it. It's okay. I'd rather spend 10 more minutes and being more accurate than go with something that is off and uh, do the portrait of someone who is not the person I was supposed to paint.
So now, okay, where is that the center of the earth? It's just at the vertical of that, so it's here. So yeah, that's what I thought. I put it a bit too off center. Jeez, it looks really weird. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Um, three months. I'm going to fix that. I mean, I'm going to try. So now everything has to change here, of course, as well. And once again, it's okay. So really for something like this, when it happens, um, Quite often it's because there was a little thing off in the construction uh, as a starter. Um, once again, it's okay. So it means surely that the here is a bit too large as well. My eye is still off, so you know I'm gonna to have to work on it, but it's okay. That's actually a good example of what I was explaining that when you do something off, just don't just don't find an excuse not to redo it. Just don't think, wow, I've done such a great job on that thing. I don't want to redo it because um, I spent X amount of time. Just redo it. And now I can see that there's more to fix because of course, you know, now it's almost like a chain reaction, but it's okay because as a result, I might get something more real. So sometimes what I do is that I hide an eye, like, is he looking at me? Yes. Is he looking at me? No. So, you know, I need to work on this one more.
So you see what I was explaining that when you paint an eye like this, it's really, you know, something really, really small can change completely um, the vision we have of the, the eye of the portrait. And I've been working now for a little time just on this eye. angry mode or panic mode or whatever you know I messed up an eye I had to redo it you know, it's like a cook if you make a bas bad sauce just don't serve it and it can happen Okay. There's a couple of things that I want to modify. I think my hair are way too light. So I'm going to do a little glaze on it because I don't want them to come, you know, in the front. They have to be in the back. Um, same thing here, I feel like, you know. So once the painting starts drying like this, that's where we can do those adjustments. It's almost like a, a post-production. I feel my thing here is way too strong. It doesn't have that strong feature here. Now that said, I have some lighter color here around the mouse, a little bit here, here it's way lighter. There's a bit more light here. It makes me laugh. 
Makes me happy. Here we are. And to finish the, I mean, finishing, as I explained earlier, I can work from on that painting for another 20 years. And then maybe I will get the, a little bit of the quality of um, a portrait by Van Dyke, which is my favorite portrait painter. I need to make sure that Isa is looking at us and I and this one too. And so let's do just the little magic trick of the the little dip, you know, the white little dot in the eye. So this one, what color is that? Uh, I think it's a light blue. I, I, I never make those, those little sparkling points in the eye white. I always like to make a color decision, even if it's a little bit, but you know. Okay, so this one, come on, don't betray me, yes. And yes. Okay, now the mirror. So I'm taking the mirror, looking at. Um, I still have that problem where it's not looking at us. Okay, so I need to fix that. Of course, that just, you know, really, really thin informations. I do believe I need to do a little bit here. Okay, now this one is looking at us. And this one needs to be toned down here. The answer is always on the photo of the model. You don't have to worry, it's always on the photo. Or the face or whatever, depending on how you work, if you work from live models or not. You don't have to worry, it's always just in front of you. The test. Yeah, uh, there's just one thing I need to change, and I think I will be okay with this one. Once again, the goal was not to necessarily produce a hyper-realistic portrait, but just to do a portrait in you know, a certain time. So you can see a little bit the way I work.
I just did something and it's typical of you know so w once we work too much or whatever and then we do something not because we saw it just because we think it's going to be better and it was not just a little bit of lighter color here because I feel like Let me see. You know, I can move the camera back so you can see. Okay, so now you know that I like to. Uh, uh, you know, it's always like this. You know, I always have the last minute something to do that I see that is not correct. So. That's exactly what I said earlier, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I stopped working on paintings, not because I think they're done, but because I, uh, because sometimes I'm, I'm limited by my own judgment. And sometimes it's great to have someone to tell you where you could go a bit further. Even if it's difficult to sometimes accept it, you know, sometimes you just don't want to hear it. You just want to say, I mean, you just want to hear that what you've done is great and then, you know, you don't need to work on it anymore. But, you know, if it has to be worked more, then... Anyway, my favorite thing, so I'm going to take the tape off. Ah, I need to be able to catch it. Here it is. Okay, let me just make sure. Yeah, we're good. I like it, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I won't. I won't tell you, but the truth is that working on paper like this is something magical because, you know, it's, I can show you uh, something about the paper, you know, like it's just round, flexible and so on. And uh, still, you know, yeah, you know, there's a couple of things I could change, but, you know, roughly it's, it's okay. Okay, bye-bye. See you soon.